This was actually uh, Dr. Bulletin's lecture, and he's in Colorado having fun, and they asked me to do, fill in for him. So this was all put together by him, and I just augmented it a little bit. So if there's anything wrong with this lecture, uh, it's Bulletin's fault. All right, so the objectives, uh, I want to review differential diagnosis for chest pain complaints, discuss the most common and life-threatening presentations, review any diagnostic approaches, including uh, CT, chest x-ray, and EKG findings, and outline any treatment modalities. I have no financial product or institutional disclosures. Before I came up here, I, I, I got on the CDC website to see how many ED visits we've had recently in the United States, and I think the data was a couple years old, and they listed, uh, we're approaching 140 million ED visits a year. So with that in mind, um, this, this data is a few years old. We see 8,000 visits a year in the emergency department, or I'm sorry, 8 million visits a year in the emergency department for chest pain. Out of those 8 million visits, there's 100, I'm sorry, there's a million visits for acute coronary syndrome, one out of eight. There's 100,000 visits for pulmonary embolism, one out of 80. And 8,000 uh, visits with uh, thoracic aortic dissection. Plus a whole lot of other stuff that presents with chest pain. Um, Borges uh, syndrome, it's pretty rare, three out of a million visits. Pneumothorax, seven and a half out of 100,000. Cardiac tamponade, one in every uh, 2,000 admitted patients. Incarcerated diaphragmatic hernias, 140 cases. Pericarditis, 3.3 out of 100,000. Pneumonia, rib fractures, which are very common. Um, and uh, reflux, pleurisy, costochondritis, varicella zoster, esophageal spasm, muscle strain, anxiety, and trauma. Um, just a couple notes about this. The, the zoster, make sure you get them undressed and look and see if there's a rash. You don't want to be that guy that does a big cardiac workup, CT and everything, and find out the patient has, has uh, shingles. That's embarrassing. And the, the muscle strain and anxiety, those should be, uh, those should be a diagnosis of exclusion. You know, don't just fall into a trap that someone's anxious, oh, you're just, and they have a history of, uh, of uh, psych problems, or they're just anxious and you miss the PE. I mean, that's happened, happened before. Okay, so the, f the first one I wanna talk about is acute coronary syndrome. This is things that we're, things that we're gonna see mo most often, most common, and most lethal. Um, they'll present with STEMIs or non-STEMIs, unstable angina, and uh, beware of bizarre presentations. Females are, are obviously atypical to us males, so they're, they're gonna present with atypical presentations. So they generally don't present with crushing chest pain, Levine sign holding their chest, diaphoresis, like you normally see in the textbooks or we normally see with, uh, with uh, our, our male patients. They'll present more with, with uh, fatigue or shortness of breath, just like elderly patients also present with fatigue, shortness of breath, or I'm just sick or I don't feel well. And they'll, they'll end up with, uh, or syncope. We, we had an elderly patient, uh, the other day at Boardman that was getting iron transfusion, she had a sinkable event. Everybody thought, oh, this is fine. She's, she just passed out. We brought, brought her over. EKG was normal. Troponin comes back positive. She starts having epigastric pain. Repeat the EKG, she's having a STEMI. But she never had chest pain. And also keep in mind, serial EKGs for ongoing chest pain. We, I teach in the, with the residents, and a lot of times they miss the fact that the patient only had one EKG and they come in with chest pain. Well, you can repeat the EKG as many times as you want, and you probably should, especially with someone that um, uh, has high risk factors for coronary artery disease or that you're just called, you're, uh, just thought is just screaming that this person has coronary artery disease. And the EKG looks normal at first, or there's, there's some ischemic changes. You know, I generally like to repeat it every 10, 15 minutes if I suspect that someone's having an uh, evolving STEMI. So anterior STEMIs, it's the anterior part of the heart. What we're gonna see on the EKG is a ST segment elevation in leads uh, uh, V1 through V4. You see reciprocal changes, 
ST segment depression in 2-3 AVF. It involves a left ventricular anterior wall and septum. And it typically you see it with uh, uh, stenosis or, or uh, thrombosis in the left main or anterior descending arteries. And the inpatient mortality is about 12%. So this is, what you're, this is what you're going to see with the anterior MI. You're going to see ST elevation anteriorly. You're going to see uh, reciprocal ST depression inferiorly. Also another, another EKG with uh, ST uh, segment elevation anteriorly. These typically are referred to as tombstone T waves, and you see some reciprocal changes inferiorly. So anterior stemmies, it's proximal LAD or the left uh, main coronary artery. This is, this is the widow maker. Uh, you don't want to miss this or you're going to find out about it in court. Um, typically you see SE elevation in V1 greater than uh, 2.5 uh, milliseconds. You could have a, a complete bundle branch block. You may see ST elevation in AVR and you, you can see ST depression in V5. Now this is um, Wellens sign. Now Wellens sign is, is a, 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 you may see it on EKGs, I'm not sure exactly how prevalent it is, but when you see this, this is suspicious for anterior STEMI. So what you're gonna see is deep precordial T wave inversions or biphasic T wave inversion in, in leads V2 and 3. And this is a sign of critical uh, left anterior descending artery stenosis. And in this, this graph here is the uh, biphasic T waves. Same thing, bi biphasic T waves uh, anteriorly, V2 and V3, a little in V4. And the uh, deep T wave inversions anteriorly. So when you see these on the EKG, these are very suspicious for uh, uh, pathology in the uh, left anterior descending uh, vessel. This is, this should, your red flag should be going up with someone with chest pain if you see this. Okay, De Winter's um, T waves, these are upslope, upsloping precordial plus leads one, two, uh, ST depression. These are peaked anterior T waves in V2 through V6. Uh, with the ascending limb starting below the baseline. So minimal uh, ST elevation is 0.5 millimeters in AVR. And this is in indicative of 2% uh, of uh, LAD occlusions. Now these are the, the, the peaked tall T waves. Sometimes you see early with STEMIs. So you can see them here, here, all anteriorly, and you can see the see the precipital changes inferiorly. Now, inferior uh, STEMIs, these are the ones we see more commonly, 40 to 50% of all MIs. It's, it shows ST elevation in 2, 3 AVF where precipital depression in 1 AVL, V5 and V6. The mortality is uh, 2 to 9%. And usually it's a dom from a dominant RCA, 80%, and then um, uh, lateral circumflex, 18%. Involves a right ventricle, and 20% of these people have AV blocks, and they have 20% mortality. These are also the ones you have to be careful given nitroglycerin too, when they have a dominant um, uh, right RCA, and you give them nitro, you're decreasing the, the preload, and their blood pressures are gonna drop. So you wanna make sure you, you uh, you hydrate these patients, especially if they're hemodynamically unstable. So here's a EKG re represents an inferior uh, STEMI with ST elevation in the 2, 3 AVF. And there's some anterior and also some lateral and anterior re reciprocal changes. Uh, lateral STEMIs. There's ST elevation in one, AVL, V5, and six, and you see reciprocal ST depression in three and AVF. 
this typically involves the, uh, the D1 branch of the LAD, the OM branch of the lateral circumflex, often combined with anterior lateral LAD or inferior posterior um, lateral circumflex. And this is the lateral left uh, ventricular free wall. So again, you see ST elevation in one AVL and in, the, uh, in four, five, and six, maybe even three. And you see re reciprocal changes inferiorly. Now, posterior MIs, something we don't generally see very often, but what you're gonna see is ST depression in V1 through V4 in the horizontal leads. You also, you'll see a RS ratio uh, of one in V1 or V2 in ST segment elevation and posterior leads V7 through V9. Now V7 and V9 is, you're gonna have to ask your, uh, your nurse or your tech, that I, need, I need a posterior uh, view, especially if you see the ST depression. And what they essentially do is they move um, five, six, I'm sorry, four, five, and six. They'll move four, five, and six more posteriorly and lateral along the chest, left side of the chest. And I'll show you a picture of that on an EKG, but essentially that's what you're, what you're looking at is these posterior leads. You can see upright T waves with ST depression in V2, V3 with tall, broad R waves. In the PDA branch of the RCA, you're, you're gonna see that's posterior descending artery in RCA in 80% of the people. So this is, um, when you see a posterior MI with, with the ST depression, one of the things you can do is flip the, uh, flip the EKG upside down, look at it backwards, and you'll see it. This will show you ST, I'm sorry I don't have an EKG, but it'll show you ST elevation in the um, anterior leads. And this is a representation of the uh, posterior uh, V789, which they relabeled the uh, four, five, and six, so they just moved in more posteriorly, and you can see that there's ST elevation in those leads. Now, uh, a new uh, left bundle branch block. By itself, in the right clinical setting, this can be an MI. When I first trained many years ago, we were taught that, oh, you can't diagnose an MI if they have a left bundle branch block. And I think the uh, guidelines at that time were if someone has a new left bundle branch block with chest pain, you know, that, would, that was an indication for um, PCI. Now, this, this uh, slide here represents uh, typical uh, EKG findings with a um, uh, left bundle branch block. So you see the W in the um, S wave, a dominant S wave in V1, in a notched M-shaped or, or wave, R wave in V6. Now, to try and diagnose a, a, a STEMI in a, in a uh, left bundle, we follow uh, Sorbosa's criteria. And this is, you know, I'm, this is somewhat difficult to memorize. I've, I read through this three times before I came to this lecture and I still don't remember it. So, so one of the things you should do is, is, and I'm not a, I don't have any disclosures, but you should get MD Calc on your iPhones and there's a very good um, app for, for plugging in Sorbosa's criteria and gives you the, the, the point system and lets you know whether or not this, this EKG is uh, representative of it. But let me just go through it real quick. The, the criteria includes uh, concordant ST elevation greater than one ML in leads with positive QRS, concordant ST depression greater than one uh, millimeter in leads uh, V1 through V3, discordant ST elevation greater than five millimeters in leads with a negative QRS, and there's uh, uh, some modified uh, criteria, ST elevation, S wave ratio, wave amplitude less than negative 0.25, or essentially ST elevation greater than 25% of the depth of the S wave. Like I said, this is, the, you know, I read through this the fourth time and I still don't understand it, so get the MD calc. But here's a normal left bundle branch block or pace rhythm with the, um, with the R wave, whoops. With the, with the notched R wave, which is discordant with the ST segment depression 
And the same thing with uh, a large S wave with discordance of uh, a T wave elevation. Now here's the uh, Cerbosa's criteria that I just mentioned. So you have, you have uh, concordant uh, SC elevation in the same direction as the uh, R wave in all leads. You have uh, discordant SC depression in leads V1, 2, and 3, or greater than 5 uh, millimeters in height of a discordance of the SD uh, segment elevation in the discordant lead. Now this is the modified uh, Sorbosa's uh, C rule criteria. I took this off of uh, the internet. But essentially it's, it's if the R wave is greater than 25% the distance of the S wave like it is here, then this is, this is an indication that this is a STEMI in a patient with underlying left bundle branch block. Again, the same thing modified uh, Cerbosa's criteria. Now there's an EKG that shows, shows what we just talked about, uh, elevated ST elevation discordant leads throughout all leads. Now let me talk about some STEMI uh, treatments. Uh, if you're working in a, a center with, uh, with a cath lab, you know, the current guidelines are, I think it's 90 minutes or less for PCI uh, or thrombotic uh, therapy. We're fortunate where we work that we, we have a cath lab within 13 miles of Boardman and we end up sending all our patients that, with a, that present with uh, an acute STEMI to Youngstown for their PCI. So what do you do in the, in the meantime there? We give them aspirin. We start them on, uh, on low-dose heparin. When I first uh, trained, we used to give everyone morphine. That's kind of fallen out of favor now because of two recent uh, trials um, that found out that there was uh, increased mortality with patients that received uh, morphine. And one of, the th one of the things that they think happened is, is the morphine affects the um, it potentiates the uh, effects of, of the platelet inhibitors. So essentially what it does is it, it stops the platelet inhibitors from working. So what, we, what when you end up happening is they have a thrombotic event because if you're giving them an oral platelet inhibitor or if you give them Berlinta before they have their, their cath, it's, it's it's potentiating the vent, so it's, it's actually stopping. I can't remember what uh, site it is. I had it on my notes here. Oh, wait. It, it, it affects the uh, P2Y12 uh, receptor agonist delaying inhibition of the uh, platelet activation and acute coronary syndromes. So that's essentially why I don't give morphine to anybody anymore for chest pain. Now, there's also data to trial, the, the uh, Pacify trial with fentanyl, and they seem to have the same problem but not as, there weren't as, as much uh, morbidity and mortality with fentanyl as there was with, with uh, morphine. So if they have pain, I'll give them, I'll give them a, a dose of fentanyl instead of morphine. Also, you want to give them IV fluids, especially if they're hypotensive or if they have an uh, inferior wall MI and the antiplatelet agent uh, per cardiology uh, or institution that uh, actually varies with, with some of our cardiologists. There's also some, some controversy with oxygen uh, therapy. Uh, people start, a lot of times we see the EMS will place somebody on a non-rebreather because they're having chest pain and their, uh, their normal uh, levels, their, their oxygen levels are normal. You know, are we, doing, are we doing harm? And there's been some studies that show that there's uh, oxygen toxicity can lead to free radical formation and actually is not beneficial to the patient. So I don't put people on oxygen unless their, their pulse ox is uh, less than 93%. Also, antirhythmics as, as needed. So non stemmies you have the troponins elevated without EKG, EKG changes in the setting of chest pain. So these patients should get aspirin, nitrates, anticoagulation, analgesics, and cardiology consult. And we generally, um, we, we'll keep these people with Boardman uh, unless they start, they have unstable angina, and um, 
we can't control their pain, and then we generally send them to a uh, PCI center. Okay, the heart score. This is relatively new. It eases the pain for low-risk chest pain patients. Essentially, um, this is also on MD Calc. Essentially, what you do is you, you calculate their, their heart score based on uh, their symptoms, their risk factors, their EKG, um, and their initial troponin. If you get a score of three or less, essentially they can go home. If it's four or more, they have a, uh, I think it's a 16% 16, 16 risk of developing uh, acute coronary event in the next six weeks, I believe. So it's, it, we use this for low risk, uh, low risk chest pain patients. Um, it actually works out pretty well. It keeps, we can't admit everybody with chest pain, so this is a good tool to use and document that you're gonna send somebody home that's low risk. Pulmonary embolism. It's a Bayesian approach to testing. Now, uh, Dr. White mentioned Bayesian. What, what Bayesian is is, is um, you have a, a theory or you have a hypothesis and it changes every time you get new information or, or new uh, data. So it's very difficult to diagnose pulmonary embolism. The patients, patients present with um, a cornucopia of symptoms. There's no one definitive test to rule out uh, uh, pulmonary embolism. Even patients that, uh, well, the gold standard is, is CTA, but years ago it was uh, aortogram or a pulmonary angiogram, and we can't do that anymore. That's, that's, there's a lot of risk involved in that, so our, our go-to is a CTA, and a lot of patients can't have a, a di die load because of their, they have kidney, kidney problems or they're allergic or whatever. So it's very difficult to diagnose this but you need a high index of suspicion of patients that have, have risk factors. So, so if in doubt, use a, a de, um, decision instrument. You can use the PERC score, and that's great. I know that the other uh, fellow was talking about PERC. It's great if it's zero. You can send them home, uh, pretty confident they don't have a PE, but if they have, they have one criteria positive in the PERC score, you have to, you're gonna have to do some other type of testing to rule them out. And also the same thing with the wells. So these patients pre present with pleuritic or respiratory phase pain. They may have syncope. This is a, this is a, you need to keep this in mind with syncope. We see this with patients with syncope and new onset AFib. That's also, uh, um, it's not in this slide, but that's also something you need to keep in mind. Um, they may have uh, low uh, SAO2 or blood pressures. The mortality is 15% if we miss this. And, um, I was kind of surprised at the beginning of the slide how many patients present with PE. I think it, we see more and more of it uh, every day. So I think those, those numbers, I think we're looking for it more often. I think that's why the numbers are going up. There's no, no specific uh, EKG findings. Um, you, you may see tachycardia. That's, I think that's the, the uh, traditional finding on, uh, on boards. You may see S1, Q3, T3, which is... Uh, you have a large S wave in lead one, you have a large Q wave in lead three, and you have uh, T wave inversion in lead three. And that's, I think that's 20% of the time. I've seen it a few times, and, uh, but that, you need to look, look out for that. Also, I, at a recent um, podcast with uh, Dr., uh, uh, what is his name, Amir Matul, he pointed out that he, they see more or he was pointing out that they see PEs with anterior T-wave inversion with or without inferior uh, T-wave inversion. So if you see somebody with, an I'm sorry. So if you see somebody with um, anterior T-wave inversion and inferior T-wave inversion, this is highly, highly uh, suspicious for um, pulmonary embolism. So keep, this is, I never really thought about this until I saw this podcast. So think, keep, keep this in mind, because I started looking for this on all EKGs, the patients that I suspect to have a PE. And you may have a complete or incomplete uh, bundle branch block, and you may see um, uh, AVR elevation. The chest X-ray and PE, it's nonspecific. Um, it's really, you're just getting the chest X-ray to rule out other causes of, of chest pain syndrome. Now the, the D-dimer, there's, 
that's relatively new as well. Its, it's, uh, it's sensitivity is high, about 95%, but its specificity is, is pretty low. Now, there's two different assays for, um, for D-dimers. Uh, there's the fibrin, fibrinogen split products and the D-dimer units. Now, there was a recent uh, study, I think it was in the British Journal of Medicine, that used aged-adjusted uh, D-dimer to rule out uh, PE. And what they said was if, if you take their, the patient's age times 10, if the D-dimer is less than, than 10 times their age, you could effectively rule them out. It was nine, uh, I think the sensitivity is in the high 90s. But that's only with, the, with D-dimer units. You can't do it with the fibrinogen split products. So I don't think that's been validated yet. That just recently came out a, a year or so ago. And we just keep that in mind. Um, I use, I use D-dimer on patients that are, that are uh, I have, they have a low suspicion or low risk. They may have a, maybe a young female that's on uh, birth control and she's a little tachycardic and we'll get, I'll get a D-dimer if the D-dimer is uh, subtherapeutic or below the, the, the upper threshold. I can safely rule them out, but um, just be careful with, it, with D-dimers. If you have someone that's highly, uh, your, your gestalt is, they have a high suspicion of PE, they have, uh, they have a malignancy, they've been traveling, their leg is swollen, they have a pleuritic chest pain, they're tachycardic, they have S1Q3, T3, I wouldn't begin a D-dimer, I'd begin a definitive test. Here's a um, CT of, uh, of, pulmonary art, of uh, pulmonary vessels with Massive uh, uh, blood clots here, 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 bilaterally, here. This is, uh, these patients, this is very serious. Now that's massive PE. Now these people are usually hemodynamically unstable. They're hypotensive, they're, they're, bradic, or they're, they're tachycardic, they're, they're uh, hypoxic. You're unable to oxygenate them. These people need treated with thrombolytics. Uh, patients with uh, massive PE or saddle emboli, uh, there's, a, there's a catheter called an ECOS catheter that our vascular surgeons will place in the pulmonary artery and use catheter-directed TPA for these. But um, even though they're hem hemodynamically unstable, they, part of the criteria for putting this catheter in is, is they need a stat echo to determine if they have um, uh, right heart strain. Now you can see that on CAT scan sometimes, you can see it with EKGs, but they won't, they won't accept these transfers until we get a echo in to demonstrate uh, um, ballooning of the right ventricle or right heart strain. Now the submassive PEs, they, these people are generally uh, stable. They still need a, a echo for evidence of right heart strain. Um, and they may have elevated biomarkers, either um, BNP or troponins. And there was a debate on whether or not these people need uh, thr thrombolized. And the current evidence does not support um, TPA for these patients. So what we're, we're currently doing is, is these patients get admitted, they get their echo, cardiology sees them, we start them on heparin. Now the uh, segmental PEs, uh, they need anticoagulation. And there's something called a PESI score you also find on MD Calc for outpatient treatment. Now, the, the PESI score is the uh, pulmonary embolism severity index. There's 11 criteria that they look at to see if this patient is a, a low risk. And if they meet criteria, uh, you can send them home on Eliquis or send them home on uh, Lovenox and Coumadin. I think the initial, if you look at the PESI, PESI uh, score and you read through everything in MD Calc, the original studies were done with bridging with Lovenox and, and Coumadin. I don't think that's, it's, uh, I'd have to ask a colleague whether or not we can send them home on, on, uh, on Eliquis or one of the other uh, um, oral anticoagulants. I would, if I was presented with that, I would, I would have to, uh, defer to, to a cardiology or someone else. But the current uh, standard of care where we work as, we, we admit all PEs. We don't, we're not sending anybody home. And I, you know, I generally don't do that unless, if you're gonna do that, I think you need to do a couple things. You need to explain to the patient they need to take this medicine every day correctly, and they need follow-up. 
and you, need to, you would need to talk to their PCP and guarantee that they have follow-up the next day or very, in the next two days so, so that they're seen again and give them very good instructions because I don't know if any, any, any of the docs in here using PESI score and sending sub-segmental PEs home? Nobody? Okay, that's what I thought. Um, thoracic aortic dissections. If untreated, there's a 33% mortality in 24 hours and 50% in 48 hours. Those numbers seem kind of low. Uh, undiagnosed mortality is estimated to be 75% in two weeks. That sounds about right. 30-day mortality is 43% for type A's and 14% for type B with repair. That's, that doesn't sound too good. And overall, five-year survival is 52% with repair. It's also not, doesn't sound very good. So the diagnosis of uh, thoracic aortic dissection, the history is, is the key to, to making this diagnosis. Um, severe sudden onset of uh, chest pain, maybe radiating to the back above the, and below the diaphragm. And they may have uh, neurological symptoms, like uh, they may present with stroke-like symptoms. Their risk factors include hypertension, connective tissue disorders, uh, bicuspid aortic valve, aortic aneurysms, and third trimester pregnancies, which is very, very, very rare. Um, they'll complain of uh, sudden onset of pain down their left, left side of their back, like somebody stabbing them um, with, a, uh, with a knife or a pair of scissors. If they start describing pain like that, and they're very anxious and they, they won't sit still, I'd be very, very uh, weary that, that, that this patient's having a dissection. And their physical exam, you'll see uh, um, there'll be differences in the pulses versus the uh, upper, upper extremity pulses. They may have JVD. You may hear a new murmur. Um, sometimes you have to ask them, did your, did your doctor ever say you had a heart murmur? Because that's kind of hard to, if you listen to it, they may not know whether or not they have a heart murmur, but you can ask them. They may know uh, from their last visit. Uh, type A's involve the ascending art, uh, aorta and the arch. It's right here. And these are surgical management. This is the ascending and the, and the arch. It's kind of a little over to the, dissect, to the uh, descending part. But. And what you see on a chest x-ray is a widened mediastinum. Um, normally this should be about eight, uh, I think it's eight centimeters. And essentially the, the, the size of, a, of, a, of an old pager. That's how long ago I practiced or went to school. But it's eight centimeters. If it's greater than eight centimeters in, in a media, in, on a portable x-ray, um, I'd be very suspicious, especially with the history of hypertension and back pain, chest pain raining to the back. The type Bs involve the descending aorta, and these are managed medically either with endovascular treatment or uh, medications. And this is a, a, a coronal scan, I'm sorry, a, sa a sagittal scan of a uh, CT of a, a type B e dissection where you can see the intimal flap running down his uh, descending aorta. Okay, initial management, um, DP over DT is essentially the, um, what this is, is the left ventricular pressure. So what, what you want to do is you want to lower left ventricular blood pressure, left ventricular pressure from the left ventricle. So how we do that is beta blockers for blood pressure control. So beta lol, you can start them on esmolol drips, nicardipine, or, um, or uh, cleveprex. And the definitive management is obviously cardiothoracic surgery. Now Borhaves syndrome, is esophageal rupture with wrenching and vomiting. And this is probably appropriate for, uh, since we just had um, oh, St. Patrick's Day. So I'm sure we'll see, we're gonna see a lot of this yesterday and we'll probably see it again today in the emergency department. But essentially, um, this can lead to uh, vomiting, seizures. The mortality is very high. And uh, these, Treatment is uh, surgery, antibiotics, and fluids. They, they're going to need an EGD as well. But here's a 
here's an x-ray of someone with uh, Borges. You can see there's mediastinal air around the, around the heart, and you can see there's air tracking up into the neck. Now, this is a good, this is a good uh, time to point out. When, you look at, when you're looking at chest x-rays, you're just not looking at, at the lungs. You need to look at all fields on the chest x-ray. So this person came in with chest pain and vomiting. Uh, if you're not paying close attention, you might miss the soft tissue air in the neck, and that should give you a, a clue that there was a, a rupture, a ruptured esophagus. Okay, uh, pneumothorax. Uh, tension requires immediate evacuation. Most of these are spontaneous, and treatment is a chest tube or a thoracentesis. And there's multiple studies where you'll revealed uh, superiority of a smaller catheters in uh, smaller uh, chest tubes versus large uh, chest tubes. Now the, um, uh, let me see, I think I got some, I got some good films. All right, this over here is the tension pneumothorax. There's uh, a large volume of air on the right side and you can see there's no lung markings on this side versus the left side and there's also some there's some uh, pressure pushing on the uh, mediastinal uh, structures to the left. So this is actually, this is actually a clinical diagnosis. Um, it's, when I was a resident, if we got an x-ray to diagnose this, they were, it was frowned upon, but this should be a clinical diagnosis. And the, and the way to treat this, the attention pneumo, is you, you want to you essentially reinflate the lung by decompressing the chest, so you would stick a a large bore needle, a large large gauge needle that's at least, um, you know, two or three centimeters long, at the second intercostal space, midclavicular line. So it's right down in here, and just to decompress the chest to reinflate the lung, and then they're going to need a, a, a chest tube, uh, definitively. On this side, this this is more of a, a spontaneous needle. You can see the outline marked with the. Uh, with the arrows, and there's no evidence uh, in this of, uh, of attention, but this can lead to attention pneumo. Now this, this is, everybody see this? A simple pneumo? It's, sometimes you really have to look, you have to have a high clinical uh, suspicion. Also, I'll, I'll say that, um, you know, we order a lot of x-rays in the emergency department, and I try and teach the residents in our APPs, you know, look at your own films, even though we're not radiologists, because these, these things can easily be missed by radiology, and, and they are. Um, but you can see there's, right here, there's a very subtle line coming up like this. So this is, this is a small, maybe 10, 15% pneumo, 20% pneumo in that range, and it's, it's very easily could be missed if you're not looking for it. Incarcerated diaphragmatic hernias. This is very uncommon. I've only seen one in uh, the 18 years I've been doing this. Um, usually they're post-traumatic, usually penetrating or stab wounds, and, and um, they need surgical reduction. And it, typically you see these, almost always you see these on the left side of the chest versus the right side of the chest because the liver is on the right side of the chest, so it protects the diaphragm, and there's really no protection on the left side. So this is a post-traumatic diaphragmatic hernia that I found on the internet. And you can see there's air fluid levels up in his chest on the left side, which is, which is not good. And you can also, when you examine these people, when you listen, you can hear bowel sounds in their chest, which is also not a, not a good uh, sign. Uh, pneumonia, I'm not gonna talk about that. Vinny did a good job reviewing this. All right, cardiac tamponade. Uh, the mortality is about, 13% up to 76%. It's a pretty, pretty wide range. The causes of this is uh, trauma. Can I think that's cancer, uh, uremia, dissection, pericarditis, and recent uh, cardiac surgery. Now the, um, the diagnosis, it's, it's pretty easy on a on, uh, clinical exam. They're hypotensive, they have JVD, they have muffled heart, sound, heart sounds, they, their lungs are clear, and they may have a, a 
Polis paradoxus, which is a, a drop in the blood pressure, systolic pressure greater than 20 with inspiration. Does anybody know what the, um, there's a triad. Anybody know what the triad is? Vex triad, that's correct. That's the, um, the distal heart, heart tones that decrease arterial pressure in distended neck veins. Vex triad. And this is, this is something we should, be, we should keep in mind now. We have ultrasound in our emergency departments. This is, easy. this is an easy clinical diagnosis to make, especially with ultrasound. Anybody know what this is? Anybody? This, this is an EKG with somebody with, uh, with uh, pericardial effusion. There, there's electrical alternance. This, this is what you're gonna see, or one of the things you can see with someone with, um, with uh, effusion. You can see the, the alternating uh, QRS complexes. The other, I thought there was, I had something else on that. Um, you can also see low voltage QRS and PR segment uh, depression. Sorry, that's the only, only EKG I have with uh, tamponade. In chest x-ray, you'll see a uh, um, globular enlarged or water bottle heart, typically with normal lung fields. So it looks like a big balloon. And on echo, you'll see a large fluid filled pericardium septal bowing towards the left ventricle and RV collapse. And this is just a, um, just a, uh, a video of, of a pericardial effusion that Ken put in. Essentially, the transducer is on top. It's, the images are upside down. And this right here, this black, that's the pericardial fusion. So this is the heart here. This is the myocardium. This is the epicardium. This white and all this black is a fusion. Uh, pericarditis uh, causes, mostly these are viral. Um, you, have, you have autoimmune. Uremic uh, drugs can cause this, and also uh, post-MI Dressler syndrome. The history, there's a, there's a prodrome of, of upper respiratory illness, viral illness, fever, uh, maybe cough, typically with uh, viral causes. They'll have pleuritic pain, they have uh, radiation to the back or their, or their left shoulder, and it's typically relieved with position. These people don't look toxic like you would see with uh, MIs too. They look, they look actually pretty good. You'll see diffuse ST segment uh, concave elevation in all leads, diffuse uh, R, or PR uh, interval depression. You can see ST depression and PR interval elevation in, in AVR. If you see ST elevation in lead three greater than lead two, this is more of a STEMI and not pericarditis. So you need to, that's one of the things you need to keep in mind when, you're, when you suspect uh, pericarditis. You need to look at lead three and two. So this is a patient with, looks like pure interval depression. I'm not seeing diffuse SD elevation here. It looks more like pure interval depression to me. Maybe some uh, SD elevation in, in uh, the inferior leads. Okay, treatment is NSAID steroids and uh, colchicine if it, you think it's uh, uremic. That's it. Do we have any questions? Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for listening.